I recently played with a virtual reality app that gave me new insight into higher order dimensional thinking. And by that I literally mean this application was designed to help three dimensional beings like ourselves think of and engage with a four dimensional object. Playing with this application confirmed one of my earlier suspicions, which is when virtual reality is designed well, it allows us and unlocks in the human race the ability to think in higher dimensional space. And the reason this is is because virtual reality is a digitally mediated three dimensional space. So that digital mediation allows you to inflect other metadata on top of this three dimensional composition. Today, I'm gonna to talk about three different virtual reality demos, all of which engage in higher dimensional thinking in their own right. I'm only gonna briefly cover the last two, but the first one that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on, mostly because I learned a huge amount from it. Um, the demo is basically taking a four dimensional hypercube and shoving it into three dimensional space um, and allowing the user to rotate that hypercube and gain new insights on how hypercubes work. Okay, so as I talk about this, I'm realizing how ridiculous I sound. Uh, and that's just sort of one of the things that happens when you talk about higher dimensional space. But the reason I still want to forge past all this absurdity is the fact that virtual reality has really unlocked a totally new understanding for me. Like, I've always wanted to get a good understanding of for whatever reason, how four-dimensional space works. Uh, I've watched YouTube videos and like read papers and read books or whatever, and it just never really clicked. It just didn't really fit into like my just understanding of the cosmos. It didn't fit into my intuition. But now with this virtual reality app, I get it like it's in my bones right like I have it in a way that I didn't have it before and that's super exciting and that's 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 the excitement that I want to share so before we do a deep dive into how multi-dimensional space works uh, I want to do a quick shout out to the two brains behind this project Wenbo Lan and Ken Perlin they're also awesome enough to open source a project so if you want to develop on it yourself or if you just want to download it and play with it because you happen to own a Vive and want to learn how four-dimensional space works you can do that uh, there's a link to the application in the description down below. Now before we jump into the VR experience I want to talk for a moment about what it means to take a higher dimensional object and shove it into a lower dimensional space. So here we have a three-dimensional cube and it's being shoved into a two-dimensional space which is the screen. Um, now what's happening in this particular case right here if you were to ignore this shadow altogether is that you are seeing this cube as represented as nothing more than a square, right? Not super descriptive when it comes to cubedness. So typically when it comes to representing higher dimensional objects in lower dimensional spaces, we will rotate that object a bit so that we can get some offset. So this is probably going to be more descriptive than the, the square we just saw, right? And as you'll notice here, this line happens to be larger than this line. And that's because this is a perspective projection. In other words, the camera location happens to exist in this three-dimensional space. It's not off towards infinity. Um, and it just so happens that when you do that, then objects that get close to the camera get larger and objects that get further away get smaller. Um, alternatively, instead of perspective projections, uh, we do have orthographic projections. Um, so in this ortho projection, let's say this is the yellow side and this is the red side. Um, this is usually used for more technical drawings to have an understanding of like schematics or maybe blueprints. Um, and this means that the camera is not existing in this three-dimensional space, but it's off towards infinity and it uh, has a, uh, a projection of all the pixels just sort of flattened against the two-dimensional space here. Uh, when it comes to cubes in two-dimensional spaces, we have a bunch of patterns that often look like this, right? So here is a very boring cube in two-dimensional space. If you were to rotate it 90 degrees, you get a cube that looks something more along the lines of this. Um, if you were to do this, then you get something more along the lines of this. This is called isomorphic projection. Another common technique for drawing cubes in three-dimensional spaces is to just have two squares that sort of overlap each other and then connect the vertices with all these lines. And as you draw these lines, you'll notice that you're creating new faces instead of just the bottom and top square. You also have this square down here, this one on the side, this one on the side, and this one on top. The only reason I'm bringing up all these patterns is that they become sort of evident when you project a hypercube into three-dimensional space uh, with an orthographic projection, which is what this Vive app does. So why don't we go ahead and just jump in and play with it. 
Great, so here we are inside the VR experience, and as you can see, we are projecting a four-dimensional hypercube into three-dimensional space. And as you can see, this is also a very, very boring projection. It looks just like a cube. This is very similar to when we took a cube, a three-dimensional cube, and projected it onto a two-dimensional surface and only drew a square, not super descriptive. But remember, to make it more descriptive, all we have to do is rotate it. And in this app, all you got to do to rotate is put your controller inside, pull the trigger, and move your hand around a bit. So here we have a projection of a four-dimensional cube onto a three-dimensional space and as you can see very similar to how we create 3D cubes on 2D surfaces by drawing two squares and drawing a bunch of connective lines here we can draw two cubes and uh, have a bunch of connective lines to uh, fit those cubes together to create a projection of a hypercube. Now on a two-dimensional projection of a 3D cube, when you draw connective lines, you're actually creating a bunch of other squares. Here, when you're drawing connective lines, you're creating a bunch of other cubes. And this is one of the first revelations that I've had when I started playing with this, was that, oh, a hypercube is nothing more than a bunch of constituent lower-level cubes. In the case of this hypercube right here, we have the bottom left, the top right, and then the connective lines will create a bunch of other cubes as well. One, two, three, four, five, six. In total, a hypercube is comprised of eight three-dimensional cubes. As I kept playing around with it, and actually the first half hour is me just doing this, but yeah, as I started playing around with it, I noticed that there are a bunch of other projections that just made a bunch of really cool patterns. So if I just offset it in this dimension, you get uh, some things that don't feel super descriptive, but they are still cool nonetheless. Um, if you offset it in two dimensions, here let me rotate again, what you get is this really weird interesting thing where you have you know the surface that is closest to us is actually the projection of a three-dimensional cube onto a two-dimensional plane, right? You have this square up here, you have this square down here, and you have all the connective lines that put them together, and you get the sense of a cube that exists down here, and in fact what I can do is I can rotate this hypercube to make this two-dimensional-ish cube feel more like a three-dimensional cube. See, here's the volume inside that cube as I keep going. Right, that cube now is, is really big. Another interesting set of projections you can play with is by offsetting a cubes like this. So you have this cube down here and then this cube up here and then playing with how much they're offset and getting a sense of what that looks like. So here, they're just barely offset. There's a huge amount of overlap in between them. And then here, there's just a little bit of overlap in between them. Remember, you know, the bottom cube is here and the top cube is here, and so they're overlapping just a little bit. Um, here, there is no overlap at all, or there's only one point of overlap. And there's something about this that just feels like a two-dimensional isomorphic projection of a three-dimensional cube, right? And the last revelation that I had when I was playing with this application was I got a good sense of how cubes fit into the hypercube geometry. In fact, it's very similar to how squares fit into the three-dimensional cube geometry. So why don't we examine this for a moment and forget about its hypercubeness. Um, what we have is uh, a cube, right? And a cube is created from a bunch of constituent squares, the top, left, right, front, back, and bottom. Um, and each square, so if I just take the front square, is connected to all the other squares except the one that's on the opposite side of the shape. And the connection between one square and another square is always exactly one line. Now if you take this learning and you bring it into the hypercube space, well you'll notice that each cube is connected to all other cubes except the one that is on the opposite side of the hypercube. So these two are not connected to each other these two are not connected to each other, these two are not directly connected to each other, and these two are not directly connected to each other. And then any cubes that are connected to each other are connected through one lower dimensional object, which in this case happens to be a square. So this cube and this cube are connected through a square, this cube and this cube are connected through a square, and this cube and this cube, etc., etc. Now I'm not going to pretend to know everything about hypercubes, but I am going to say that this application for sure helped me gain a better understanding and appreciation of how hypercubes work uh, so that you know when I'm trying to understand how four-dimensional space works, I'm not just sort of standing in a room imagining my body you know being projected in perpetuity in a non 
Euclidean dimension, right? Like, <laughs> I don't need to think about like uh, multiple universes and and uh, like hyperspace or whatever. All I have to do is like jump in and program an application to do this stuff for me, and I get like a more granular, intuitive understanding of how this stuff works. So I have another application that I wanted to show here, which uh, basically depicts the fourth dimension in a different way. Instead of a fourth dimensional spatial Euclidean dimension, uh, it depicts the fourth dimension across the dimension of time, which I'm hoping is very useful when it comes to dance education. So let me just fire that up and I'll be right back. So one cool example of where you can encode a bunch of additional information into your three-dimensional spaces is this little app that I've created. And all it does is it you know, gives your hand, uh, your controller, uh, the ability to leave a trail when you pull the trigger button. So you can leave a trail, and then when you pull the grip button, the trail will disappear. Now, I sort of developed this because I'm really interested in human motion in, in three-dimensional spaces. I happen to also be a teacher of dance, and the form of dance I do is called liquid, which is rave-style dancing. Um, and in this case, you know, this particular dance move is called the figure eight. I mean, it might not be evident why it's called the figure eight, but if I were to leave a trail like this, um, becomes pretty damn obvious why we call this the figure eight. It is this nice repeatable motion that you get to do over and over and over again. And I'm just, all I'm really trying to point out here is that virtual reality is a phenomenal way to pack in extra information to encode it into three-dimensional spaces. Now the last demo that I want to go over is this one right here. It's very similar to the dance demo I was just leaving a trail behind before, but here we have a chair that's going to be flung off into the distance and it's going to leave a trail. And the, uh, the amount of the trail that we see is going to be controlled by this controller down here. So now, as you can see, there's initial impact and the, the chair gets sort of flung off into the distance. And, you know, it has all these, like, awesome and cool protrusions, so it leaves these really beautiful shapes in its path. And then it hits the ground, and then that's how it reacts, right? So now, look at how cool this is, right? Like, I mean, I would, you know, if I had all the resources in the world, I would definitely want to make this into a, a, a sculpture. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess just to note, like, how meaningful it is and how much data there is in here, I guess it just sort of goes to show that now that we have VR, we can really start becoming four-dimensional thinkers. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Um, if you want to download the um, 4D Hypercube demo, just go to my website. Uh, thanks ke to Ken and Wenbo for allowing me to not only feature the work, but also to uh, offer a download. If you want, that stuff is completely open source, so you can go to the GitHub repo to download and play with that yourself. Uh, additionally, um, I don't know, I guess I, all I want to point out is that, like, to me, VR is not just, like, putting... I mean, it's pretty awesome to be able to have immersive experiences and to make first-person shooters that are super immersive or whatever, but really what the power of VR is to me is the ability to pack in additional information inside your 3D experiences um, to be able to embody uh, higher-dimensional thinking. Um, so, thanks again for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time.